to uh, declarations of interest. Anybody got any declarations of interest which they want to bring forward? No. 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 Okay. No, no declarations of interest. Uh, that's for um, anybody watching. Members are required to declare any personal, prejudicial or disclosable pecuniary interest that they may have relating to items on the agenda and state the nature of such interest. And uh, we've, we've got no uh, declarations for this meeting. OK, that takes us to item <coughs> minutes uh, from the previous committee. Um, I'd like to uh, just run through those for any uh, amendments or changes that anybody wants to, uh, to make. So um, this is um, the meeting held on Friday the 28th of February 2020. Um, any changes to page one? Page two. Page three, page four, page five, page six, and page seven, and finally page eight. Okay, can we take those minutes as being read? No, true and fair view. Yeah, okay, thank you, Keith. Yeah. All right, for the, for the minutes then, uh, the minutes were accepted at the previous meeting. Uh, can I just take us to uh, the action points? Um, on page four, um, section six, internal audit, uh, the action point to uh, bring follow-up uh, IT audit work to this committee in June. Uh, that will be covered in item, uh, gender item 11, oh, uh, gender item eight, sorry. Um, also action on page six, Section 11, Governance, um, take the revised Memorandum of Understanding to the TFN Board on the 12th of March. Uh, I understand that was done, uh, so we can take that as done. Um, and page 7, Section 13, present further risk analysis uh, after the budget, um, and that will be covered in the risk section, um, which is item 10 on this agenda. OK, uh, thanks for that. Um, that takes us on to um, item four now, which is the monthly operating report. And I think, Ian, you're going to take us through through that. So over to you, Ian. Yep, sorry, just just unmuting myself. Um, I wasn't going to go through the, the monthly operating report in detail. Um, there were probably a couple of things, or one thing in particular, a couple of things I was going to draw to draw people's attention to, and then happy happy to take questions. Um, the the first um, matter is um, in relation to Northern Powers Rail funding. Um, you you may recall um, uh, from the from the um, document that, that that there is a note in there about funding and a and a. a an after month end note about TFN having secured funding approval um, for for NPR. There have been, as I'm, I don't think some members will be aware, um, some ongoing discussions with the department about the exact um, nature of the funding commitments for, for Northern Powers Rail. That has now been largely resolved. We've got funding commitments of £40 million through to the end of this year. Um, uh, We've got another six million which of, of, of commitments which are subject to um, an ongoing review, um, but work is, is currently being undertaken um, from that six million. Um, and then the balance, as, as members will be aware, the, the, the total allocation is 59 million. Um, the balance um, we, we will seek to draw down again, uh, draw down against over the course of the year um, as we progress. Um, so we reported in, in previous monthly operating reports that, that, that there were um, some, some difficulties and some issues around the, the NPR funding. Those, those now, um, certainly for the time being, um, uh, uh, are resolved. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to just draw people's attention to was that there is a, um, a, a, an, an appendix at the back uh, of this report that just picks up the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on some of the specific programmes. So from page 25 on, onwards, there is an annex that looks in detail at the um, the impacts and, and, and the risk effects of COVID-19 across TFN. So that was just to, to 
to draw your attention to that and the and the um, the work that's being done and is is continues to be done to assess the risks of the of, of the impact of the pandemic programs. Um, I wasn't intending to say anything other than that, Chair, other than other than to invite questions. Okay, so let's uh, open it up. Any, anybody want to uh, ask Ian about that? Everybody's pretty happy with the report. Yeah. Okay. Um, any any issues at all that uh, anybody wants to talk about on that particular item? Bye. This is Keith. <coughs> um, just just for a question for Ian. Uh, in most local councils, any dates that have been affected by COVID-19 have been put back either six months or 12 months. Uh, can you give us any indication as to what... Um, uh, has that been agreed with government that some of our uh, time factors have been put back 12 months or six months or something like that? Is, or is, is, is that in terms of, of, of statutory deadlines, Keith? Or, or yeah, just yeah, I think so. Yeah, just where we were supposed to be, be bringing stuff to uh, to government by a certain time or a spend by a certain time. Some of the spends have been going back 12 months. You know, um, we we have. We, we the, the 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 statutory extensions or the the, the, the emergency legislation that has extended that has extended the time scales we've got to do things like like um, approve the accounts for instance apply to us in the same way as they apply to others um, we are trying to um, get the accounts signed off to the normal timetable because I think if we if we can do that then it would be it would be wise to to, to proceed on that basis um, in terms of of other um, of other delays we've we've i think because of the nature of our operations um we're we're, we're doing it as a as on a on a case by case basis so we we are attempting to minimize the the impacts and where we can continue um then we're we're attempting to do so i mean the the nature of t f n as an organization as you as you're aware keith in in most in most of its its areas of operation um means that actually we can we can work from Work remotely reasonably well. Um, there is a there is a presentation on the next item where I'll just pick up some of the issues that we we are potentially having. And certainly in the longer term, I think I think there may be issues. But in terms of delivering this year's business plan, we are trying to rather than taking you know allowing big big steps backwards in time, we're we're, we're trying to maintain the the momentum where we can. Um, and, and we should be able to do that. I think <coughs> in a review. Okay. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Uh, Mark, I think you want to come in there. Uh, yes, please, Chair. Uh, just just a quick one. The, the £59 million, pounds, and I'm, 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 apologies if I missed it somewhere else, £59 million pounds on the NPR, you said it's got to be finished, got to be spent by the year end. Two questions. First of all, um, which year end? Is it fiscal year end or, or calendar year end? And secondly, it's a loss of money to spend in that time can, can you sort of uh, take up the offer? Because obviously central government's recycling money all over the place at the moment. Yeah, so um, it's the, the 59 million allocation is for the financial year, so it's through to March 2021. The actual um, the business plan that TFM put together for this year um, was based on the 59 million TDF allocation. Um, so the budget includes... Um, the budget included a lot of activity that was predicated on on being able to access that funding. So the the budget included 43 million of what what was essentially um, required required activity to do the sifting process, um, to do the phasing, and also to um, to re refresh the SOC. And then there was a, a, a I think 17 16 between 16 and 17 million pounds worth of contingency, which was to, was to be drawn down for for work that arose. Um, going through the year and, and certainly towards the back end of the year and to, to start doing preparation work um, for OB, OBC activity um, and certainly in some areas trying to get on the ground in terms of surveys and the like. Um, so that was all baked into the that was all baked into the budget. Um, so the, the the money that we that we have received to date roughly aligns with the committed activity, the, the the SOC activity and the sifting activity that we'd included in the budget. We are so far, uh, Mark, proceeding um, 
pretty much in line with budget. So we spent six six million pounds up until the end of the second month of the financial year um, on NPR. That is pretty much bang on the budget that we had. So we're we're, we're spending to to profile at the moment, um, and certainly in terms of that that forty odd million pounds that is committed. Um, I would I would expect us to spend all of that, and certainly I know the team, the NPR team, um, are discussing with the co-clients at the at the de- department, bringing forward other work that can be can be drawn down against the contingency. So I don't think there's going to be a, a, a problem um, at a macro level utilising those funds to to a good purpose. There there may be some shortfall in, in expenditure around the fringes. Thank you, Chair. Well done. <laughs> OK, thanks. Um, doesn't look like we've got um, any further questions on this item. So um, in that case, um, can we move to item five, which is the COVID um, update? And I think, Ian, you're picking that one up, too. Um, yeah, so I will uh, I will now attempt to, uh, to to put this on screen, if I may. Mm-hmm. Can, can everybody see that? Yeah, yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, all good here, Ian. Good. Um, so this 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 is really just to 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 bring um, members of the committee up to to give them a view uh, an insight into the the um, the way TFN has responded to the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, it, it really covers two elements. One is is the immediate impacts on um, TFN's operations and, and, and how we've responded um, to the lockdown. Um, and the second part is the kind of longer term risks that it potentially poses for us. Now, some of this is, is was picked up in Annex A of the monthly operating report, and some of it is also um, picked up in the um, risk register report in item 10. But I think it, we felt it was useful just to get it all together in one place. So you can be given that the, the pandemic is, is occupying such a, a central role in, uh, in in all sorts of considerations just at the moment. Um, it's probably best if I'm happy to take questions as, as I go, if people if, if people have got them. Um, so just just first up, we, we've we've gone into a, a, a cycle of um, HR reporting, keeping keeping tabs on on um, certainly in detail the, the last four weeks and, and presenting that. Um, I think it's 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 fair to say that the the absence levels um, are actually on a par with with previously. And actually, if you if you knock out some non COVID related um, long term sickness, um, which in a relatively small organisation doesn't need to be very many many people, um, the absence levels underlying absence levels are actually better than they they would be normally um and i guess there's probably everybody can probably see the the, the logic in that um we've we've not we have have um made um flexible working offers to the to the to the um the workforce at, at, at tfn um and there have been some a small number of annual leave requests due to to COVID nineteen um, the, the wider impacts and that but there haven't been any unpaid leave requests in the last in the last four weeks certainly um, and um, we are still continuing to to recruit people so recruitment activity is transferred onto teams um, and we are still we are still able we, the, the budget and the business plan for this year envisage recruiting reasonably large numbers of people and we are still able um we are finding to to recruit those people so um paul as uh, paul kelly who's on this call as an example was recruited using um te- the, the the team's um application in terms of of, of remote working obviously the last audit committee that we had was 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 Almost seems like a, a, a different era. Um, it was a pre pre COVID nineteen meeting. Um, we we did um, have a reasonable um, amount of, um, of of warning that this was go- going to strike, and we did take the opportunity to um, take the business continuity plan and, and make some COVID nineteen specific um, amendments to it. So we, TFN actually locked down. Or went into remote working about a week before um, the, the, the government mandated it. Um, 
so we did we, we and we found actually that those those are those processes and procedures have worked quite well um there there we've enhanced um we've enhanced internal communications to keep employees informed we've we've um emphasized the the flexible working arrangements that we, that we have within t f n to help um help employees who have carers responsibilities particularly with um, with children um we have got an enhanced um health and wellbeing support program for for uh, for employees um and we have um obviously um adjusted our onboarding and offboarding processes in order to take account of, of COVID-19 restrictions. So yeah, I think... Ian, can I just yeah. interrupt you there? I think we've got a, yeah. a question from Kevin before we move sure, on. Sure, yeah, yeah. Too far on. Sorry. yeah well, well, it's, it's really uh, j- just sort of two parts, really, Ian. Yeah. Uh, what one really is just a, a query around the effectiveness of the BCP. Um, did, did that work uh, as well as you expected, or were there any particular sort of uh, gaps that you found in the business um, yep. uh, plan, uh, you know, business recovery and, and business yep. continuity. Um, and the, the, the second is uh, around the, the longer term uh, implications for remote working and, and the organisational sort of um, uh, behaviour and culture and, and in terms of office space. Is it, are you seeing any Anything at this stage that would suggest that you, you, there's, a, there's a need to review, um, you know, at a sort of significant level, you know, at a materially significant level? Yeah, um, I think the the if I take the first of those, um, I think the, the business continuity plan was as, as generally acknowledged to be, to be effective. I think it was it was interesting because because we did get. Um, a reasonable warning that this was this was making its way towards us and and um gareth and and, and the team and others um had a you know took, took significant steps to understand what what impact that might have and and how we might um change our our, our process or at least ready our processes in terms of things like approvals and 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 you know signing signing off and bank um and and, and the kind of process he type um things that we needed to worry about how they might work while still maintaining control and um, we we very much took the view that we 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 haven't got any any workarounds in there's no overrides anywhere in the business continuity plan um in 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 light of covid-19 all the controls that existed before are, are still operating um i th- i think actually what we did was we put in a, a what might be described as a whole series of, of additional scaffolding around the around the, the business recovery plan to, to reinforce it and make it robust more robust but actually we haven't as, as the previous slide showed we haven't had any real direct impact from COVID-19 so the, the impact has really been the same as it would have been had, had, had we not been able to access the office for any reason um, we haven't lost you know, large numbers of, of, of staff, particularly large numbers of staff who, who've got approve, approval um, responsibilities within the, within the system, and um, we haven't, you know, we haven't been impacted in that way. And so, actually, we've got we, we'd reinforced the processes and procedures, um, but actually, the 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 the, um, the additional challenges that we'd anticipated from COVID nineteen haven't materialised, and, and and actually, as a result of that, I think the whole thing's worked quite well. Um, in terms of the long term, we, we've we've just completed a survey of um, employees and line managers um, in, in relation to future working arrangements. Um, I've not got the we we don't have so I've not got the, um, the 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 results of that yet, but it is something that we're certainly um, considering. Um, the, the the lease on the Leeds office is 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 up in the reasonably near future, and we do potentially need to make some decisions about how we. Um, how we deal with that um i i suspect it we, we may end up in a i don't know in a short-term arrangement um whilst, whilst we make a longer-term decision i i i don't doubt that this is going to have a longer-term impact i'm just not sure what it is at the moment and I'm, and I'm not sure anybody can be sure um i think we just need to 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 get a few more data points before we can we can make proper decisions about it thanks for that Ian. that's really helpful um so if I just move on to the the, the risks, um, the, the first set of risks really relate to um, our ability to, to, to operate in the short to medium term. 
So we, we've already picked up some of these. There's, there's a there's a generalised efficiency impact from from remote working and, and from potential staff absence, both within TFN and the supply chain. And um, thankfully, the, the latter of those, with with some some um, um, unfortunate exceptions, has not really has not really hit. So we're, we're left with with the the, the impacts of, of remote working. Um, and those those actually, when we're talking about about you know, the internal workings of TFN are, are, are relatively have, have been seen to be relatively minor. Um, where I think things get slightly more complicated is 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 in terms of a partner capacity to actually contribute to TFN working groups uh, and decision making. So there is an awful lot of, of engagement goes on at a working group level between TFN and and partner officers. And obviously, those partner officers, some of some some of them have got, or indeed a lot of them have got operational responsibilities, um, and and they've obviously been under under quite a lot of pressure. Now, uh, quite a lot of the partners have actually taken steps to ensure that they can maintain the level of interaction with TFN, um, which has been very positive. Um, but that is just something that we are we are conscious of that that some of the people within within partner organisations that we are dealing with have have got some some really rather pressing and immediate concerns that they've got to deal with and obviously that potentially risks their ability to engage with our programs and um, i think the, the third thing is is around risk is around national capacity um there are a number of there are a number of national level policy decisions um that that need to be made and obviously those are being um delayed or or made more difficult by by the pandemic so um you know, the integrated rail plan and the timing of the integrated rail plans um, reporting is obviously a, a key issue, um, certainly around NPR. But there are other, other things. Um, you know, we are not cited at the moment. And I, I spoke to departmental colleagues earlier in the week when we're not cited on, on exactly when the spending review might might occur, for instance. So there are there are things that we could really do, do with knowing in order to progress our work um, that need to be resolved at a, a, a national level that that we're, we're, we're unsure as to exactly when some of that might happen now. Um, and then internally, we have diverted some resources um, to the to the economic uh, recovery plan proposals that TFN is developing. Those were discussed at, at board yesterday. Um, I think there's a, a there's a broad um, um, cohort of support around that from from northern leaders. Um, but obviously that has required us to to take resources and switch resources from from other things within TFN. So the 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 COVID-19 um, immediate risks that are set out in Annex A of the operating report pick up um, it show the effects of, of, of these risks that are listed here. Has anybody got any questions on that before I move on? No, I think we're OK. Thank you. Cool. Um, and then... Um, Secondly, the, 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 there are a couple of long term um, impacts that this 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 may have. Um, and, the, and these these I think split two ways. One is around future um, business cases and the ability to get um, you know, government spending, which which is likely to be to be restrained or constrained in some way um, to to to. Um, you know, to be deployed, to deploy, get, get government to deploy that spending within the north, um, and and you know, some of this comes back to um, you know if there is if there is severe economic pressure, if Treasury has got a, a severe problem in terms of the amount of money that's coming in, will there be a reversion back to an economic focus and a and, and a and a focus on project BCRs rather than some of the wider transformational benefits and, and levelling up benefits that that we. Um, would seek to to promote as transport for the north. Now, certainly, you know, whilst I think this this is a risk, the the the, the headline policy statements that are coming out, or the and and and, and the things that I'm reading in the media and we're we're, we're hearing um, from within government is that the levelling up agenda is still very important, and therefore it, it should be possible to to um, to make the case for northern projects, even even where the BCRs might be impacted by. By the, the the economic destruction caused by COVID nineteen, but I think that's something that is going to be a risk until we until we can see a pipeline of projects being approved. I, I think the second thing, the second long term potential long term issue is around is around rail services. Um, 
clearly at the moment what, what, what we are what we are seeing is a supply problem um, that given the social distancing um, restrictions the, the biggest issue that the railway system has at the moment is is its ability to to carry more than a small fraction of the of the passengers that it would would normally expect to to carry given any given amount of rolling stock in operation um, obviously at some point that is going to going to swap over to being a demand problem um, and actually encouraging people back onto the railways now certainly in terms of of northern's revenue split i think off the top of the top of my head, it, it, it was roughly roughly half and half. It wasn't quite half and half because there's some other other revenue streams in there, but it was roughly half and half between subsidy and 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 passenger revenues. Um, obviously, if those passenger revenues are significantly in, in, uh, have declined significantly, and that's going to increase the requirement for s- subsidy, uh, and that obviously poses some risk to um, our ability either to to deliver some of the franchise improvements or the that, that, that were previously um, previously agreed, or to make the case for for further improvements to the system. Now, again, the, 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 I think the the the, the conversations we're having and, the, and what we're hearing is is, is broadly pol- positive around the around the desire of government to to um, you know again in relation to the levelling up agenda and, and 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 climate change environmental agendas to not to keep keep the railway as a as a critical part of the of the of the transport system but clearly if if we have a a, a major fall off on demand then that is going to make making the case for 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 railway slightly more difficult so it's the those i think are the main the main risks that we've we've identified and those those two latter risks are set out in the corporate uh, risk register report at item 10 um, so that was that was all I really had to say about COVID nineteen, and, and happy to take questions. Uh, question from Liam, I think. Liam. Yes, thanks for that, Chair. If I'm back on microphone and, and camera, um, yeah, really just a sort of quick question to Ian about those last points about kind of um, rail services uh, in the future, really, because I think one of the things I'm most conscious of is the way that. Um, national government communications uh, have been handled in the past few weeks. There's a very negative message around public transport. Um, now, understandably, in the short term, for health reasons, obviously, we want people not to be using public transport unless uh, they really have to. But I'm very conscious about the kind of long term impact of that and the potential stigma it might give to, to public transport. As part of our kind of COVID recovery work, are we thinking about the the necessary measures we might need to be uh, leading on across the north of England, actually to give passengers the confidence to be using public transport into the long term. Because once we get out the other end of this pandemic, now more than ever, we will need uh, an efficient and effective public transport network for the success of the north. So we're starting to factor in what some of those kind of things may need to be. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not close to the detail of, of... Of, of what is going on with the strategic rail team, but I know that those very points you're making, um, Liam, are, are, are recognised um, both by our, our team and, and um, also by members um, and constituent authorities a, a, across the north. I know there was a, a discussion in the board meeting yesterday um, um, around operational rail, and I think everybody can can see <coughs> the, the importance uh, and the potential challenges involved in getting getting patronage on the on the system back up to the levels that we 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 well, we want we want to see in terms of economic recovery but also to support um climate um, change objectives as well so that is a that is a key thing that the the um operational rail strategy team is is working on and it, it may be that if that's something that that um uh, you, you wanted to the, the 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 committee would like um somebody from the the strat rail team to come and um and present on at some point in the in the future that, that that's something that we could certainly look at if that was of interest is that is that something you'd like Liam? I think it would probably be quite helpful because I think um, if handled well, we can do something in best practice. If it's not something that um, we're focusing on enough, it actually could be a big risk to our whole agenda. So, yeah, I think that could be, be a useful sort of uh, topic in the future. Yeah. We, we okay. can, uh, I can hear a phone ringing, but can we bring uh, Mark in, <laughs> please? Yeah. Uh, I don't... 
I don't think it's my phone that's ringing. I, I don't know. Somebody's got a phone oh. ringing somewhere. Oh, it is actually. <laughs> Apologies. It was my nice. phone. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a way of getting noticed. Uh, <clears throat> just, just very quickly, sort of building on from Ian's point, uh, and Ian's quite right. We, we've got to sort of uh, do some sort of strategic work around around rail per se, uh, and it's it's really it's not a, a, a rail north problem. It, it's a rail UK problem. Um, I, I'm involved with West Midlands trains, as, as, as people probably know, and and they're working on five percent patronage, same as the rest of the country, uh, and. Uh, People just don't honestly feel safe going out into public, and quite rightly so, I think sometimes. So, so I, the, the question really is: when we're doing this this presentation, when we're doing this work, are you aligned with with other um, areas in the country in the UK where where we've got exactly the same problem? Thank you. Um, I I'm not. I'm not close to the detail of what our, our team is, is, do, is doing, Mark, in terms of their, their, their kind of day to day discussions that, that they're having. Um, so I, 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 that's something I can I can pick up with them. I mean, I, I know there are um, because of the because of the nature of the, of the rail network. I know there are ongoing discussions that take place between our team and and um, others acro across the system because the whole thing's so, so heavily interlinked. So I, I would I would assume that that, that, that is indeed um the case, but that's something I can um, we can specifically ask them about if we uh, get them to present. Okay, would that be all right, Mark? Um, yeah, yeah, yes, that? please. It, it could be an interesting discussion because, as I say, it's it's not just a rail north problem. It's it's actually a, a public transport uh, problem per se, and school transport as well. But uh, we don't want to go too too big on on the uh, remit. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I just bring um, David in, please? Um, yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, just following on from that point, I, yeah, I, I, I'd appreciate um, some feeding from the strategic rail team because I think there has to be a post-COVID recovery plan, confidence in public transport, you know, an appropriate, you know, sort of phased measures and what that might look like. And I know some of it at the moment will just be putting your finger up into the wind, but it's, um, I think it's important um, that there's a sort of strategic oversight on on where that recovery and regaining the public confidence in the in the transport system, if only in the north, you know, I mean, obviously in coordination, but I, I think that's an important piece of work um, that the committee should have sight of there, or at least is knowing that it's ongoing and where, who, is it, who is it linked in with and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll we'll, we'll pick up. We'll make sure they pick all of that up. Um, and they, we'll, 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 um, what I suggest, Chris, is we get them get them maybe to come and do a presentation in July in the July meeting. Yeah, I think that makes yeah, a lot of sense. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah. We'll get them okay. to pick that up. Okay. On the actions. All right. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Chris. That's all noted. Thank you very much, um, Ian. Uh, if you want to just uh, move forward then to finish off the report. Yeah, no, I think that that was everything. That was the that was the last page, um, Chris. Okay. I will. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that, Ian. Uh, helpful update. Um, that takes us actually to um, the year-end uh, statutory accounts item six, and I think Gareth, you're going to uh, take us through that. I am indeed, sir. Thank you very much. It's the most wonderful time of the year when we review our financial performance over the last twelve months. Um, and there's two ways in which we do that. Um, we look at performance against budget, um, and we call that the financial outturn. But we also prepare the, um, the statutory accounts, and those accounts are prepared in line with um, accounting practice and statute. So there's fundamental difference between our performance to budget and the numbers that appear in the accounts. And the role of this committee is to review the financial outturn, um, which we always present to to the committee, um, but also to endorse the statutory accounts that will be audited by the external auditors and that will eventually go forth to the TFM board um, as those charged with governance. That's the, the legal term for those who, who finally sign the accounts up, and that's on the 29th of July. So we've prepared a packet of documentation for you today, um, and that consists of three principal documents. There is our financial outturn report that I can take you through. There is the draft accounts, which is 80 pages of fairly complicated information. 
And then I presented a, uh, will present a presentation that just takes you through the statutory accounts and hopefully lifts the lid on, on the information and makes it a bit more accessible. So today is the first um, session in which the committee will review this documentation. And then we have a second committee stage on the 16th of July. And it's at that point that hopefully the committee will be able to endorse the accounts that will go forward to TFM board. OK. That's that's fine, guys. Yeah, that's Excellent. Okay. Um, so the first thing I'll do is just take you through the the financial outturn report. Um, I'm not going to dwell too heavily on this, um, because it largely reflects the position that we presented to the to the committee in February. So the the document outlines that over the course of financial year 2019-20, um, TFN incurred expenditure of 46.82 million pounds. Now, the composition of that expenditure largely reflects what we thought it would, and it reflects the fact that TFN is a commissioning organization. So the significant majority of our expenditure is on professional services, where we buy in support from contractors and consultants, um, but also on people costs. And that reflects the growing cohort of staff that TFN employs. And the third largest element of expenditure is around BAT. So committee members will be familiar with the fact that TFN cannot recover its irrecoverable BAT, so that adds a significant cost to the organisation. Now, at £46.82 million, pounds, um, we are significantly behind the opening budget, um, and we know all about this. We've talked about it throughout the year, and this reflects that financial reporting has been dominated throughout the year by phase three of the IST programme and what happened there. So board members will recall that in January 2020, the TFM board opted to, to cancel uh, phase three in its existing guise and move to two um, related but distinct areas of activity. So that is the smart on rail and the local schemes. So these are schemes that could help deliver the phase three objectives, but we cancelled the existing scheme. And the effect of cancelling that scheme was that we had no capital expenditure related to phase three of the ICT programme during the year. So we are £30.89 million pounds behind budget um, against the opening base budget. 92% of that variance relates to that capital programme. And of that value, around £26 million relates to the individual scheme on ICT phase three. So it is an overbearing issue that has dominated our accounts throughout the year and can really mask a lot of other underlying movements. And just to conclude, um, what I'll say is that the, the grants that um, TFN has received during the year have largely been applied to expenditure, but some grant that we have received hasn't, um, and that relates to either savings that we've made during the year or slipped activity. Now, none of those grants are at risk. All the uh, grant that we received that had to be used in year was used in year, so all grants that we haven't applied will be rolled forward into financial year 2020-21, applied to expenditure in year. And so I'm happy to take any questions on the financial outturn position. Anybody? Uh, Liam Robinson. Liam. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Liam. Yeah, th thanks very much. And, sort of, um, and thanks for all the, the sort of uh, reports that you've given through. I think they're actually really useful, having gone through the sort of draft accounts at this stage. Again, just going to pick up on a point I've raised at previous meetings around the sort of integrated smart ticketing piece. Within the sort of draft accounts, page 13, item 9, um, I just think we need to beef up the wording within the table because um, you're absolutely right. Yes, we had to suspend um, the Abbott project. But that wasn't because of TFN's choosing. Uh, it was because of the, the bus operators um, refusing to work in partnership on this. And I think that actually needs to be reflected properly in the table. I appreciate it's within the narrative on page 20, uh, but I think it should be up front in the actual kind of um, KPI table because TFN shouldn't get criticism on that point. It was not our fault. It was the fact that partner organisations would not work with us on it. Yeah, uh, no, Ian, we can we can certainly take that forward um, when we come to to publish the final accounts. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Liam. That's probably probably helpful. Yeah, I, I think it is important. to uh, agree with Liam to make sure it's clear to the end readers that um, <clears throat> you know what what the issues are. Um, 
So yeah, no, no, I, I support you with that, Ian. Okay, so if you can do that, good. Uh, any other questions for Gareth Wells at the moment? No. Okay, Gareth. Okay. Um, so the second stage, I propose just to take you through the presentation that I prepared to support um, the inter interpretation and scrutiny of the, the statutory account. So as I've said, there is a PDF that holds the draft accounts that we published um, for scrutiny by electors and yourselves. It is an inherently technical document, so I think it's probably worth going through the presentation. Um, and then if there are any particular questions associated with the accounts themselves, I can take them at the end. Um, what I would say is that I have roughly an hour um, to take through this presentation. So if there are any questions, it would be greatly appreciated. So I'm, I'm not just talking to my laptop for, for an hour. That, that would be great. So please just um, do feel free to stop me as I go. And um, I'll ask at the end of each slide if anyone needs anything clarifying. So without further ado, um, I'm just going to try and load the presentation. I had a trial run on this earlier and it seemed to work, but um, I'm not the most technically gifted. So here we go. That's it, I think. Yeah, we're okay. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so this is just a contents page. I'm just going to explain what I'm going to take you through. So the, the first point is around the public inspection period, and this is how TFN complies with the law around how we prepare our accounts and make them available um, for public scrutiny. The second point is around the basis of preparation, um, and this is just the rules that determine how we prepare our accounts, the rules to which we are, um, we work, and where where relevant the statute that we um, we use to to override some accounting rules. The third point is I'm going to take you through um, some of the key items in this year's account. So I'm going to talk to the issues um, before we actually look at the financial statements. And hopefully that adds some context that will help you interpret what is within those statements. The fourth point is I'll take you through the structure of the account. So I think it's probably useful for you to understand um, how the uh, accounts are put together, the composition of them, and again, how that supports you understand in the story that the account should be telling you. And the final point is that I'll just briefly explain how we reconcile between our management outturn. So that is the, the position we just talked about, our performance against budget to what we call the CIES, which is the, the Comprehensive Income and Expenditure Statement. So if you're in the private sector, that would be your profit and loss account. So um, there'll be a bit of reconciliation there that, again, will hopefully provide a little bit of a bridge in your understanding from movements between budget and the statement of accounts. So the public inspection period. Now, statute requires us to hold our draft accounts open to public inspection. So if you are a local elector, i.e. you have um, a vote, you're on the public um, register in the north of England, you have a statutory right to inspect uh, records and ask questions of the external auditor. So the external auditor is, is Mazan, and Karen is on the call as the, the nominated external auditor. So anyone in the north of England who is an elector has the right to inspect our records. Now that could be anything within reason that um, doesn't contain overtly personal or commercial information. So just, uh, in, just for context, how this um, applied in the past um, year. So last year when we performed this exercise, there was an individual elected who opted to see every TFN invoice that had been paid over the last 12 months, so over financial year 1819. And TFN is obliged under law to provide that information to the elector. But this is really cut into the chase in terms of TFN's transparency agenda and what the law requires of a public body in terms of making itself um, overtly transparent um, to aid public scrutiny of our affairs. So the, trans uh, the inspection period must last for 30 days. Um, now, regulations were changed this year to allow our authorities an additional two months to prepare their accounts, um, but TFN has opted to work to the existing timeline. So we um, prepared our draft accounts and we made them open for public inspection on the 31st of May for a period commencing the um, 1st of June to the 10th of July. So 
So our public can, um, our draft accounts are open. They are available for inspection on the TFM website, and they will be there up until the 10th of July. So any elector across the north of England can review those documents and can ask questions of Mazars. Okay, um, now that public inspection period is um, is the same as every other local government body. Um, what may change to um, your own individual authorities is when you have opted to publish your draft accounts. So we've done ours at the earliest available opportunity. Other people have taken advantage of the flexibility in the timeline to defer them to a later date at this stage. So is there any questions on the public inspection period? Have we uh, had any, uh, do you know if we've had any uh, actual questions so far or, or not? Um, we've certainly not. I'm not aware of any questions that have gone directly to Mazars, but um, no, we've not received anything. Okay. Uh, can I just bring Mark in there, please? Yeah. Just, just a very quick point. Um, at that county, we, we because of the cost of finding every single invoice and every single uh, coffee ticket, um, well, we put a limit, I think, of £500 uh on, on invoices that have got to be registered or put forward, and I think we we we've sort of um, uh, squared the circle on that with with uh, central government. But well, I just I just think if if one person asks, it must have cost a fortune to have that information put together. Um, just thoughts on that, really? Yeah, yeah. I had to go to W. H. Smith and buy a sharpie pen and redact all the information on the the um, on the invoices relating to bank details. So it is a nuisance. Um, TFN does publish all um, financial transactions over £500. So we're, we're probably similar. We do that on a quarterly basis. Again, that is available for public consumption on TFN's website. Um, I think it's, it's probably fair to say that as last year was our first year, we were um, we, we, we went into this um, on the basis that we, we would provide everything that was asked for um, and take a view on, on whether – the individual ask were onerous going forward. Now, we only had the one ask. It was just that they asked for everything, um, which, which wasn't great. Um, but we, we, we do feel that it is important to be as transparent as possible, particularly for a young organization in its infancy. Um, so I'm sure that's one Ian and Paul, um, in consultation with, with Karen from Mazars, will, will look at into the future. Can I just come back on that? Uh, <clears throat> There must be some sort of um, um, because it's in a way it's public money, same as us, it's taxpayers' money. Um, to go to the to the, the degree of finding so many um, so much information for one person does seem to be be excessive, and I think it's something as an audit committee. Um, when you've, you we almost need a little bit of a sort of a, a paper and, and for it to come back to us for, for what our thoughts are on it, but. I personally think it's excessive for that. And and if if there's anything over five hundred pounds publicly available, that that's that's actually um it, it's it's good going really for for any organisation that a large organisation when you when you're dealing in millions. Sorry, sorry, chair. Okay, no, that's fine. Yeah, um, uh, uh, presumably can have a look at that, Gareth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I bring uh, Kevin in, please? Yeah, it was just just a point for clarification, uh, Gareth. Really, um, you're saying that we're, we're staying with the original timetable for su submission of final accounts, um, and yet the the Mazars paper on a uh, to eight talks about revised key date no later than 30th of November. So I'm just a bit confused. So I just be grateful for clarification on what timeline we are actually working to. Yeah, so um, before COVID, regulation required that we publish our draft accounts on the 31st of May and have the accounts um, approved by board no later than the, the end of July. Um, now, that is the timetable that we've opted to work to. So it, that is an optional choice on our behalf. Government have changed regulations to move um, the requirements for the, the no later than date for publication and for approval. Um, okay, that's going to bring Karen said. in. I think she wants to make a point on that. Yeah, well, it, 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 two points, really. So um, just going back to the original um, questions that were raised around inspect, uh, people inspecting the accounts. 
I'm not aware, based on uh, my experience and over, over very many years now, that anybody has ever been able to restrict someone's access to um, looking at documents on the basis of the cost of providing the information. So this isn't like the Freedom of Information uh, request system where it is possible to do that. So I think my advice would be that if you were thinking about restricting what someone is able to see beyond redacting things because they are personal um, information or they are uh, very commercially sensitive, then I would strongly encourage you to take legal advice before you do so. It's not my job to um, arbitrate, if you like, on the on the uh, provision of information to uh, people who ask for it. It's my job to deal with any questions or objections they may wish to make as a result of what they inspect. And I'm very clear about that being my role. But I would strongly advise you to um, take advice before you refuse to provide information if the regulations uh, suggest that people are entitled to see it. Just in terms of the deadline, um, just to be clear, we are working with you towards giving an audit opinion in July, but there are some things that are out with all of our control that may impact that. And one of those is in relation to uh, receiving assurances in respect of the pension fund, the local government pension fund. So the reason that we've provided an update report that refers to the absolute backstop date of November is just in case when we come to report to you in July, uh, having completed as much work as we possibly can, we are still waiting for information from other people that prevents us from moving forward to sign off. So at this stage, I don't anticipate a problem, but I'm just hedging my bets, I think, Kevin, is the uh, is the phrase. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand that. And a number of organisations are, are, are doing likewise. I'm just sort of uh, in terms of this committee and um, providing sort of assurance to the, the board, should there be a slippage, then... Presumably, there would be a need to to bring this committee back at, at, in a different sort of timeline than beyond the end of July. Yeah, or to consider specific delegations for, through um, particular members of the committee, if that's the easiest way to do something. But it will very much depend on what is outstanding at the end of July and then what the committee's views are um, around how comfortable or not they are in dealing with that in that way. But as it stands at the moment, I anticipate we'll do everything we need to do. I'm just slightly nervous about the bit where I'm reliant, uh, funnily enough, on myself uh, with my other hat on as the pension fund auditor, um, because the uh, obviously the, the, the change in the timetable will also affect the preparation of pension fund accounts. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Gareth. So back, back to you. Okay, um, move on to the next slide. Um, sorry. This is a preparation. Um, so TFN is prescribed as, um, as a local government body for the Office for National St uh, Statistics. So every new body um, has to go through a review from, um, from the ONS, um, and they did prescribe TFN as a local government body. So that means that TFN prepares its um, stat accounts in the same manner as other local government bodies, such as uh, city councils or unitaries, um, and combined authorities. Um, now, those accounts are prepared in accordance with the SIPPA code, that's the Chartered Institute, Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, and they produce a code that prescribes how accounting um, should be re re reflected in, in the annual accounts. Now, the SIPPA code recognises accounting standards and statutory accounting requirements. So under regulation, um, the government requires us to, to prepare our accounts per the code, but they also recognise that there are some instances where accounting standards do not necessarily work for the public sector. And in those instances, there are what we call statutory overrides. So where accounting standards and statute differs, statute has precedence. And that will be important for um, when we come to look at the, the accounts in the next couple of slides. Okay. Okay, guys, thank you. So key items in this year's accounts. Um, I'm just going to take you through some of the major movements. You would probably be familiar with um, what I'm going to talk about next. Um, but this will help give some context for when we look at the individual statements themselves. So the major movement in this year's accounts is the reclassification of capitalised 2018-19 ICT Phase 3 expenditure as revenue. So members will be familiar um, with some of the reports that were taken over the, the last year that talked about 
the implications of the cancellation of the, the Phase 3 program on capitalised expenditure from the prior year. So in 2018-19, £4.32 million pounds worth of Phase 3 expenditure was capitalised as an intangible asset under construction. So this reflects the, the expenditure that we incurred in 1819 was taken to the balance sheet as an asset, reflecting that we were developing complex information systems that would provide economic benefit into the future. So that capitalization was in accordance with proper accounting practice. It was in last year's books that were audited, and it was deemed correct at the time. However, the January 2020 decision to cancel the scheme renders that expenditure aborted. So we know now that there will be no asset created as a result of that expenditure. So to recognise that, the transaction is reclassified in 2019-20 as revenue. And the implication of that is that the asset is written down in full and our funding is adjusted. So the major movements there are that the £4.32 million worth of intangible asset is written down out of the balance sheet. So that asset is taken off the balance sheet and we charge it through the income and expenditure statement, that's the P&L, and um, to the um, to the ICT service line. Now, to fund that transaction, because all of a sudden we've got some new revenue expenditure, we received a grant from the Department of Transport equal to that value, and we credited that to the CIES. So we credited a grant to the P&L effectively. So that matches off the expenditure that we've had to process as a result of that classification. Now, when we processed the transaction in 2018-19 and we recognised some capital expenditure, we funded that capital expenditure from a capital grant. So all of a sudden, if we've reversed that capital expenditure, we need to reverse the funding as well that we applied in 1819. So in doing that, we've reversed the funding um, out of the capital adjustment account and reversed it into a capital grant unapplied account. So what we're saying there is that all of a sudden, because we've written that expenditure out and because we've written it into the, uh, the IE&E, an applied revenue grant, we have that capital grant back for use. So we have £4.32 million in bank and we have £4.32 million in our capital grants on applied account. And we can use that then to fund capital expenditure into the future. So that has been part applied in year to IST capital expenditure. So it's a fairly complex transaction, but the, the upshot is that the expenditure we showed on the balance sheet last year, we've reversed. And in doing so, we've reversed the funding as well. So it's a net nil transaction to TFN, and it just makes it as it should have been um, after the reversal. So I'm com um, aware that that's a, a fairly complex transaction, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions on that if there are any. I don't think there are. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Garth. Yeah, um, just a bit fiddly, and uh, but just really straightening things up. Yeah. Yeah. So last year we talked quite a bit about pensions and the impact of um, pensions accounting on um, TFN statement of accounts, and I'm pleased to say um, we we need to talk about that again. Um, now, the, the starting point for how we account for pensions is to reflect that there is a fundamental difference between how TFN pays employers' pension contributions to its pension fund and how accounting standards value the net estimated liability. So this is a real problem, um, and it, it can distort people's interpretation of accounts, so it's important that we, we spend a little time just discussing this. So... Our pension fund is the Greater Manchester Pension Fund, and that pension fund calculates on the basis of uh, long-range reviews every three years. So every three years, we undertake what we call a triannual valuation with the pension fund. It casts forward, it reviews assumptions around how many members we might be, con might be contributing into the scheme, what pay inflation might look like, what mortality rates might look like, so we can take a view on how long pensioners will be drawing on pension funds, and it also looks at forecast returns from its investments in the marketplace. 
So those training reviews um, deliver a contribution rate um, and monthly payments are made on that basis. So a contribution rate is just the rate that TFN as an employer needs to pay into the pension fund every year. And that will change on that three-year cycle. So the pension fund is, is casting forward into the future. It chucks in lots of different assumptions and then it says, OK, TFN, your members will contribute X and we think you need to pay Y. And that will mean that there will always be sufficient assets within the fund to pay um, pension contributions into the future. Now, the pension fund does that calculation under law. So how, how it takes that view is prescribed and the actuary performs that calculation with respect to those regulations. The problem we have is that accounting standards require a different basis of calculation. So throughout the year, we pay our dues with respect to how the pension fund requires calculation. But right at the year end, we have to show some accounting on our pension um, fund and requirements per accounting standards. And the problem is that that accounting standard is largely driven by a discount rate. So that is a, an inflator or a deflator that is calculated from the spot performance of high quality bonds. So a high quality bond might be a bond issued by a safe company, let's say Apple, um, and that would be on the basis of the valuation of those bonds on one particular date. So that is the 31st of March. And if you recall back to last year, the 31st of March was the date on which we left the EU. And that threw markets into flux, and that drove up the price of high-quality bonds. So if you're in the marketplace and you're looking to invest your funds, if the markets are in flux, you want to put your money with a really safe counterparty. So lots of people chasing the same bonds, that um, a safe drives up the price of those bonds. So last year, we had a particular issue associated with, um, with the um, exit from the European Union. This year, when we came to um, came to price everything on the 31st of March, markets were in flux once again this year due to COVID-19. So obviously it wasn't long after the UK had gone into lockdown. So year on year, we've had two major issues um, on the same date that have affected our pension calculations. Now, the annual return on investments as measured at the 31st of March for the um, Greater Manchester Pension Fund was minus 8.5%. So it was doing much better than that throughout the year. But as measured on that particular date during the year, the fund's performance was minus 8.5. So the financial shock drives a lower discount rate, and that lower discount rate increases the value of our liabilities. So the fundamental difference here is that we have one pension fund that's performing calculations based on uh, long-range views, and we have accounting standards that are taking a very short snapshot on the 31st of March. And that leads to a, a fundamental discrepancy uh, between how we view the world. Okay, so the next slide is um, exactly the same slide that I presented last year, and I didn't think I'd have to do it again because of how we... Um, we were in one-off territory, but low it has come to pass that just at the wrong time, we had another um, major issue to contend with. Sorry. Okay. So this is just a flow chart that just tries to, to explain what we just talked about. So where there is market fears, it reduces risk appetite. So if you are concerned and you're an investor and you're in the market and you are concerned about the state of the financial market, it will reduce your risk appetite. So you are more likely to want to invest in, in a safe bond or a safe haven. So if more investors are chasing the same safe products, it will lead to a higher price of those safe products. So the market is driving up the price because everyone is chasing the same assets. Higher prices on fixed rate bonds reduce yield. So price and yield are inverse to one another. So the higher the price, the lower the return. So just as an example, if you were to buy a 1 million percent interest and it would only yield 0.7%. So because you are willing to pay more for that yield, 
the price goes up, your yield goes down. So low yield in bond markets reduces discount rates. And low discount rates drive higher estimated liabilities on our pension fund. So year on year, we've had two fundamental issues within the markets when we have priced our pension net, net estimated liabilities. Because the markets were in flux in March 2019, because the markets were in flux in March 2020, bond prices have gone up, the yields have come down, and our net estimated liabilities have gone up. So it's, it's a nuisance that we have to report this again, but um, that, that is a fundamental issue for us in our accounts this year. And when we look at the balance sheet in a few slides time, you will be able to see that the pension liability has risen considerably. Um, are there any questions at that stage? Again, I'm, I'm con conscious that it's, it's a fairly technical issue. Um, hopefully, committee members will roughly recall this slide from last year. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, we do recall it from last year. Um, it's just, um, uh, I guess, unfortunate that we're in the same place again. Uh, we, I know this time last year we never imagined we have in a, a similar situation. But, of course, it's worth recognising that this is not um, just limited to, to, to TFN. It's um, uh, obviously uh, all government organisations will be facing similar kind of issues. Yep. Now, just to, to finish off on um, pensions counting, I think there's, there's four other important points that it's worth us um, considering. So I talked about the fund undergoing um, a triannual valuation. Now, um, that, that's, that's the review that takes place every three years. Now, 2019-20 was the last triennial evaluation date. So um, the, the, the actual cash forward, it looked at our, our um, assumptions and it decided that TFN's employer contributions should be 17.4%. So that was an increase um, on the prior year where we were paying 15.3%. And that, that's suggesting that TFN is going to have to put more cash into the fund and the fund will have to invest that to meet um, future pension liabilities. Now, at 17.4, um, coupled with um, employee contributions averaging around 8%, this means we are putting 25% of salaries into the fund each year. And that is a higher value than most bodies. So we've done a comparative exercise with the pension fund, and us putting in 25% is quite a bit higher than other organisations. So we have some comfort that the, the actuary has reviewed this recently. We have some comfort that we're putting in a considerable amount of salaries. Um, however, we do know that we need to reflect on market performance. So that leads us on to the second point, and that's on the impact of COVID-19 on the wider financial environment. So it is unclear at this time what the longer term impacts will be on the fund's performance. So we're very aware there's a short term impact and we can see that in the terms of the accounting in how we value things on that spot basis at the end of March. But if we think back to the, the funds um, um, means of measuring forward where they take a longer term view, it is still unclear what that means on a longer term perspective. Whether COVID-19 will lead to long term ripples in the economy into the future, different ways of working that impacts on economic performance or whether we, um, we see what has been referred to as a V-shaped or a U-shaped recovery, where actually this is a short-term impact and we all get back to business fairly quickly. So um, we'll have to wait and see on that. I think the third point is that um, having some in-depth discussions with the, the pension fund, we need to reflect on the fact that as um, TFN's employee cohort continues to grow, um, it's in accounting liability for its pension fund is also likely to grow, but it will eventually correct itself. Now, then this is, again, a function of the difference between actuarial valuations and accounting valuations. So if we just take a very simple example, um, I'm about to, to leave TFN um, and I'm about to go to a, another um, organisation, another local government body. And when I join that local government body, um, the South Yorkshire Pension Fund and the Greater Manchester Pension Fund will look at my um, contributions 
um, and determine the level of um, assets to be transferred from Greater Manchester into South Yorkshire. And that should mean that I don't represent a bid when I move over to the new pension fund. Now, that is based on, on one calculation, but again, in accounting terms, because they measure things differently, I will probably reflect a liability when I move to my new employer. So the accounting differences between the actuary's valuation and the accounting standard will mean that TFM benefits in accounting terms and my new employer will show a liability. Now, again, that doesn't make sense because the actuaries have put their heads together and determined what a sensible asset share would be to transfer. But it is that fundamental difference between how one set of people value things and how the other set values things. And that will correct over time, but it will forever show as a difference until that correction. The final point is that should market problems persist and should fund performance lag behind forecast, it is possible that employer contributions will have to increase. So if it looks like that deficit will crystallise and we'll have a shortfall in three years' time, when the actuary comes to reassess TFN's pension fund position, they may say that we need to put in a higher contribution rate. So we talk about this in, in terms of uh, it, it being some theoretical issue. At some point, this may end up costing us more. And that's something that um, Ian and Paul are well aware of and that we need to prepare for in our medium-term planning. Okay, so that, that brings us to the end of our pensions counting um, section. Again, very conscious that it's inherently technical, um, but if there are any questions, I'll, I'll endeavour to, to answer them as best I can. Well, first of all, Gareth, uh, thank you very much indeed for a very clear uh, explanation. Uh, that's very good. Thank you. Uh, okay. Any, any additional questions from anybody? No, um, I think we remember a lot of the issues from last year, so thank you. Thank you for that, Gareth. Okay. Okay, my, my slides have come slightly out of kilter, so I'm just going to cast back um, to grant accounting. Um, so grant accounting is, is really quite important in, in terms of how our statement of accounts will look. Um, and this um, really cuts to the fact that TFN is an almost entirely grant-funded organisation. So how TFN accounts for those grants becomes really important. So there's two really important issues that um, I'd like us to reflect on. Um, and the first one is that TFN, how TFN recognises grants received as income is important, um, and that is prescribed by accounting standards. Where grant income is shown on the face of our income and expenditure account is really important, because again, that is, um, is regulated by accounting standards. And we need to also reflect on how grants are recognised as income, but might not yet, not yet be applied to income and health. So there are quite a few bits of um, accounting um, rules around this that determine how we show income on the face of the um, income and expenditure account. And the key determinants on, on how we apply that treatment are whether the conditions of use have been met. So government may um, award us grants that have certain conditionality on them, such as they need to be spent by a certain time or they can only be spent by a certain time. Um, or can only be spent on certain um, elements of expenditure. There may be restrictions on use, so government may determine quite prescriptively what we can and cannot do with that expenditure. Um, and we also um, need to consider treatments on how unused allocations may have to be returned to grantor. So we talked before as a committee about our transport development fund grants and the fact that that is time limited. If we don't use it, theoretically, we have to give it back to government. And the final condition is whether grants are capital or revenue in nature. So I'm just going to skip forward again now to just get us back on track. I'm not sure why that, that slide has come out of line. So grants are shown in the consolidated income and expenditure account. And there are two tables in the, the accounts documentation um, that are presented on this slide. And if I would just be useful for us just to cast around um, clockwise starting from the top right hand corner, and I'll just briefly explain some of the movements um, this year. 
So there are two fundamental places where, where income can be shown on the income and expenditure account, um, and that is either above the line or below the line. And what I'm referring to there is that the top bit of the income and expenditure account is called the service lines. So if we have expenditure that is discrete to individual services, i.e. it can only be used on NPR activity or only used on integrated and smart ticketing activity, and so on and so forth, it has to go against the individual service line. And that is the table at the bottom of the slide. If we have any general grant um, that has no ring fences and can be applied to any expenditure, it goes on the grant income um, and non-specific grants income and expenditure line. And that's below the line. So that is a fundamental difference. So just starting from the top right-hand corner of the slide, um, Members will be aware that TFM receives an annual allocation of core grants. So in 1920, I'm recording that we received £10 million of core grants, and that is on ring fence. We can use it as, as we please, um, and that is really valuable to TFM because of, um, because of its flexibility. Now, you'll notice that in 2018-19, that grant value is £16 million. And that just reflects that in 2018-19, we received a lot of balances from Greater Manchester Combined Authority, who were the previous accountable body for TFM. So when TFM was set up as a statutory entity, there were lots of grants that were held on its behalf by GMCA that were transferred in. And that included underspends from prior years. So we recorded £16 million of grant received last year. And the difference between that, that 10 and the 16 was taken to our reserves. So we'll talk about our core grant reserves and we'll talk before as a committee about our reserve strategy. Those reserves came from that £6 million variance between core grant received in 1920 and 1819. And moving down to the next slide, um, you'll see um, significant increases in IST revenue grants um, between 2018-19 when it was £3 million and 2019-20 when it was just shy of 9 million. Now this principally reflects the fact that there is 4.32 million pounds worth of IST revenue in there related to the phase three reclassification that we talked about earlier. So this is the first time that we'll see uh, the implications of what we've done there. So we've got the, the income recorded, um, it's been placed against the service line within the, the INE. Um, but what we're also seeing now, part of the, the increase, is the fact that all phase three expenditure in 1920 has been classified as revenue. So in 1819, it was largely classified as capital, but in 1920, it's all revenue. And that reflects that we knew all about the uncertainty around phase three in April, May last year. The third box just shows um, Rail North contributions, and you'll note that there are a couple of lines for Rail North, and they are all marginally higher in 1920 than they were in 1819. And this simply reflects that Rail North income is indexed, so it increases every year in line with inflation, so it will switch up marginally. Now, inflation is not really particularly high at the moment, so the increases aren't particularly material. It's coming round again, round the clock to the bottom left-hand corner. Um, we have integrated and smart ticketing phase one. Now, we refer to this as um, REFCOS, and that is revenue expenditure funded by capital under statute. So we're recognising some income here related to um, phase one, um, which is the it's on rail scheme, where we are spending money um, to um, provide uh, ticket gates and um, mobile field equipment for um, taking tickets and, and payments on trains and so on and so forth. Now, that is capital by and large. But because we are spending money on other people's assets, I mean, we are not creating assets for TFN, we have to classify it as revenue. So it goes through our revenue account, through the income and expenditure account, but we fund that expenditure from capital grants. And that, again, recognises a statutory override. So this is one of the important places where accounting standards say you need to do one thing, but statute says you need to do something else. So again, this recognises the fact that in the um, public sector apparatus, 
Um, the Department of Transport might have an objective to put ticket gates on all train stations to enable smart ticketing. Um, but to do that, they give Transport for the North some money, Transport for the North, then contracts with a train operating company. So it's there is an asset produced but it's not held by TFN and it's not held by the Department of Transport. Now, the statutory override suggests that we can treat that transaction as capital, but the accounting standards say that we need to show it as revenue. So it goes through here, but we apply capital expenditure to fund the transaction. Okay, and then um, I'll go to the top left-hand box, um, and this is showing capital grants that has been applied um, against expenditure in year. Now, because it is capital um, expenditure with capital income applied to it, it goes through the non-specific grant line rather than through the grant income credited to services. And this is an accounting um, rule that just determines where we show that capital income applied in year. So you'll note that in 2018-19, that value is much higher than in 2019-20. In 2019-20, all we have there is £940,000 of Space 2 IST capital. Now, that 940 just reflects that in year we received some grant from the Department of Transport. We pulled down that grant immediately and we applied its capital expenditure. All of our IST capital expenditure was funded from capital grants unapplied. So there's a real difference here between the prior year and future and 1920. In 1819, we had lots of capital grant transferred in from Greater Manchester Combined Authority um, and lots of grant received from the Department of the Transport. Now there's a fundamental rule uh, that we have to recognize and that rule suggests that if capital grant received in year um, meets conditions of use, then it needs to be shown as income and then it needs to be taken to the capital grant unapplied account and effectively held in reserve. So last year we had lots of grant that we received as we became a statutory entity. We recognised that grant and we either applied it to expenditure incurred in year or we took it through to our reserves. So that's the reason why there's a much higher balance in 1819 than there is in 1920. Okay, um, I'm happy to take any questions on that slide. Again, I recognise that this is, is quite complicated um, and it's, it's largely driven by the accounting rules to which we have to conform. Any, any questions? No, I think we're good to move on, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we just looked at how we recognised um, capital uh, um, grants income, sorry, um, through the accounts. One of the important things is also to recognise how we treat uh, grants that were received in year, but we haven't applied to expenditure. So we refer to that as capital grants uh, as grants unapplied, sorry. Now, how we treat those grants um, is dependent on certain um, certain issues. So we can hold grants as grants received in advance, um, and that recognises a creditor or a liability on our balance sheet. Um, now, we do that where we note that there are restrictions on grants. That means that they have to be returned to the Department of Transport if they're not used. So this is really important in relation to our transport development funding that um, comes um, from the Department for Northern Powerhouse Rail. There are lots and lots of conditions on the usage of that of that grant. So every year, if we have any grant um, remaining at the end of the year, we have to show that balance as a liability. And that just reflects that the department may well say to us that we need to hand that grant back because we've not applied it in year. So we show a liability. We can also show um, grants in grants unapplied. Now that's a reserve for capital grants, and we just talked about that. So we show grant there where the conditions of use have been met, but the resource has not yet been applied to meet expenditure. So if I just have a, a very simple um, example, if we receive £10 million to, to fund our, um, our capital programme, we may spend £5 million, £5 million of that in a year, and we're left with £5 million. Now, if the conditions of use have been met, 
uh, or if there are no conditions of use applied to that grant, we will recognize that grant through the income and expenditure account and we'll hold it effectively in reserve. And then in future years, we'll apply that to expenditure. Some grant can be um, taken to what we call an earmarked revenue reserve. So that's a reserve for revenue grants that may only be applied to specific expenditure, but where the conditions of use have been met um, and it's not been applied to expenditure. So again, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we receive um, IST revenue grant year on year. Now, again, we may get two million pounds of IST revenue grant. We might only need to spend a million pounds of that in year. So the balance we take through to an earmarked reserve. And it's earmarked because it can only be used for IST activity. And the final point is around our general fund reserves. So this is our general reserve where revenue grant without restrictions on usage is held. So we talked about that previously on the last slide. This is limited to our core grant. So the £10 million that we receive each year, any underspend against that, we will take the balance through the income expenditure account and then hold it as a general fund core grant reserve. So that reserve, that core grant reserve is what forms the basis of our reserve strategy. And that is used to support our um, affairs into the future. So the next slide is just going to show this in terms of where we hold things. And I'll briefly talk about that. So I'll start from the, the top left hand corner. Um, you will be able to see that in 2018-19, um, we held just short of £900,000 in revenue grants received in advance. So this is our Transport Development Fund, and this is the grant that we get from government that, the, um, that has lots of conditions on use. And that um, the department may well turn around to us and say, you've not spent the money, please send it back to us. Now, at the end of the year in 1819, we had £900,000 of that, but we came to an agreement with government that we would use that, um, that grant already held to fund expenditure in the year. So the fact that that £890,000 is reduced to just £10,000 reflects that we've spent the money in 1920. I'll come around the clock um, and I'll go to um, capital grants unapplied and the phase one grant. Um, uh, so the general grants. So the, the sorry, the arrow is slightly off. The arrow should be pointing to seven hundred thousand pounds. So general IST capital grant has increased. So it's gone from seven hundred thousand pounds to three point six nine million pounds. And this reflects our old friend, the four point three two million pounds of eighteen nineteen capital expenditure. So I mentioned earlier that if we reverse the expenditure out, we also have to reverse the funding. So when we reverse the funding, we've recognised that capital grant again in capital grants unapplied. So we re-recognise the funding and then we've used some of that funding to, um, to apply to expenditure in the year. I will drop down again. The core grant reserve that we just talked about, our general fund core grant reserve, has increased by five, from 5.58 million to 6.46 million. And that recognises slippage and savings in the year. So some of the things that have caused us some issues in the area around TAME underspends are recognised by the fact that that general reserve has increased. So where we have slippage, we'll hold that money in reserves and we'll feed it into the budget in 2020-21 to fund any slipped activity. We also have an integrated and smart tickets in earmark reserve. Um, in 1819, that was 1.94 million. It's come down to 0.94 million. And this reflects um, a, a net movement. There's been some increase and in some um, draws on, on that reserve. But we were always planning to draw down roughly £1 million from reserves to support the budget in the year. So that has ended up as we expected it to. I'll just come around the clock again um, to our devolved powers reserve. Um, so it, of the savings we've made on core grants during the year, um, we have um, chosen... Um, with the consent of the board to divert half a million pounds worth of that saving to it, an earmarked devolved powers reserve. So this reflects that TFN is acutely aware of the emerging devolution agenda that um, is, is prevalent on government's radar and is particularly important to our board members. 
However, we're not entirely sure what the shape of that devolution ask might look like. We're not entirely sure how government may choose to engage us with that. But what we do know is that it would be prudent to have a fairly sizable pot of money to resource any asks that may come from, from that agenda. So as part of the 2019-20 um, budget process, we agreed that we'd earmark half a million pounds, and that was um, re-endorsed as part of the 2020-21 budget process. So when you look at our balance sheet now, there will be half a million pounds that is available for use to support the devolution agenda. I just pop back up the, the clock and go back to capital grants unapplied. So you'll be able to see um, phase one capital grant was 1.41 million in 2018-19, and that's reduced to 0.3 million in 2019-20. And this just reflects that um, capital grant has been drawn on to part fund the phase one its own rail project in the year. Okay. So that, that is how we show our capital grants on applied. So as at the end of the year, there's just short of 12 million pounds worth of grants that we are holding that we can apply to expenditure into the future. Some of that grant is earmarked to specific activity. Some of it is available for wider use and some of it is revenue and some of it is capital. So I'm open to, to questions at that point. Don't think we've got any questions. Yeah, I think we're okay to. Good. Okay. Another important point within this year's count is our capital expenditure. Um, so we've got 4.66 million pounds worth of capital expenditure in the year. Um, there is development of intangible assets. So you recall that TFN has an ERP system. That's an enterprise resource planning system. This is the, the, the back office infrastructure familiar to most organizations, finance system, the HR system, project management systems, and so on. So over the course of the year, there was £111,000 spent on developing that system. That system is operational, and it's being amortized in line with the contract length. So we've added to that system, but we're also amortizing it. The larger amount of expended capex during the year on intangibles was on the phase two complex information systems that are under development. So these information systems are around um, giving the, the northern passenger transport user better access to transport information around journey times, disruption, and so on, and fares. And the important movement in year was that the disruption messaging tool has moved into operational state. So last year, all this was shown as under construction. This year, we've moved some of that into operational status. And that reflects that West Yorkshire, um, I believe Liverpool City Region, and Greater Manchester have all started using this disruption messaging tool. So that's a good result. The second point um, that we talked about is revenue expenditure funded under capital from statute. So we incurred £2.27 million pounds worth of expenditure on, on what we consider as capital. Um, now, assets are created as a result of this work, whether they be ticket lines that you might see at a train station or the field equipment that the guard might present to you on the train when you try and buy a ticket on the train. That also relates to back office. Um, um, so the systems that the rail delivery group needs put in place to ensure that um, transactions received from those ticket lines are received from the field equipment can go into the, um, the RDG back office and spit the money into the right place. So ordinarily, that would be treated as revenue expenditure, but as I've said, TFN um, used the statute to override accounting standards and treat that expenditure as capital. So we recognise the expenditure in the CIES as no assets are created on TFN's balance sheet. Okay. Okay, thanks, guys. Right, so those are the fundamental issues in this year's account. Um, so if you thought that was complicated, um, this is going to blow your mind. Um, but there are some major issues that we talked about. So we know about pensions. We know about the, the phase three reclassification of 1819 expenditure. We have specific issues about how we reflect grant income. And we have specific issues about how we show capital expenditure. So the structure of the accounts is as this. Now, I think there are there are three um, useful parts of the accounts that we can consider. Now, the first is the narrative statement. So this is where TFN tells its story. So 
we we are required to prepare a narrative statement, but what's in there and what we talk about is up to us. So we show the structure of the account. We talk about what TFN's objectives are. Talk about our qualitative performance, which is why the KPIs are in there. We also talk about our financial performance on an outturn basis, so our performance against the budget. And then we talk about our outlook for the future. So this is, again, TFN's opportunity to tell a story that will help give some context to what's going to come through these statutory accounts. So the next section is the statutory accounts. And these are the bits that we, we are required to include and that are prescribed either by accounting rules or by statute about what we have to show and how we show it. So we will have an independent auditor's report that will be inserted up upon the completion of the audit. We have what we call a statement of responsibilities that simply outlines who is responsible for what in the accounts, whether it be Ian or the chief executive or the chair of the board. And we also show the core financial statements. So the core financial statements are the comprehensive income and expenditure statement, which if you were in the private sector, would be called the P&L, the profit and loss. We also have a movement in reserve statement that just takes how that IE um, statement um, net expenditure flows through to reserves. And then we have a balance sheet, which most people will be familiar with. And we also have a cash flow statement that just describes the movements of our cash from one year to the next. Now, those statements are supported by disclosure notes. So those disclosure notes will help explain the financial statements. There's also quite a few notes that we are required to include um, under law as by statute about the transparency agenda. So there'll be lots of notes within the accounts that you may have seen around um, officer remuneration, pay bans, and so on. Uh, they aren't required by accounts and standards, but they are required by statute. So we include them. And finally, we have the annual governance statement. So the annual governance statement details how decisions are made, how risks are identified and managed and mitigated, and highlights any areas of concern. So hopefully members will be familiar with the AGS because we've brought it through the last couple of sessions um, for comment. Okay, so I'm going to show you the core financial statements now. Um, I'll go through them one at a time. And I've included some support in narrative to help you understand what is in those statements and help the, um, hopefully drill down into some of the detail. So the first statement we'll look at is the Comprehensive Income and Expenditure Statement, that is the CIES. And this details the income and expenditure for the year in accounting terms. And that's the really important um, point there. The statement is prepared in accounting terms rather than as with our financial outturn position against our budget. So it differs from management accounting um, due to two issues. The first is the application of stand accounting standards. So accounting standards requires to show um, items through the, the stat accounts in a certain way. And the second point is that we have to reflect statutory provision. So again, there are certain things that statute requires us to do through the CIES that we do not need to do through the management accounts. So key issues include treatment of capital items. So we talked about a few of those around ref costs, about how we apply um, capital grants in year. The second one is around treatment of net estimated pension liabilities. So again, we talked about some of the problems associated with the um, how pensions accounted for. Or, uh, third issue, sorry, is around recognition of grant income. So again, we talked about how we have to reflect some grant income through our comprehensive income statement, but not others. And the final point is a recognition of a provision for accumulated absences. So under um, under accounting standards, we have to take a provision at the year end for any untaken leave. And we do not show that in our management accounts because under contract, that provision will not result in a cash flow. But we are required to prepare it under accounting standards. So this is our comprehensive income and expenditure statement. <clears throat> So the statement is taken directly from the draft accounts that you've seen, but I've annotated this just to highlight some of the more important issues and help you understand what this table is showing. Because this should really tell you a story, but because it's so complicated, it's difficult to interpret that. So the place to start is within the, the top middle, and um, just under the words income and expenditure. 
and the, the banner. So the CIS structure is shown in accordance with our management accounts reporting structure. So what I'm saying here is that when I prepare our management accounting reporting, we show expenditure by the thematic activity heads that we work to. So we show expenditure in relation to the strategic development corridors and the open powerhouse rail program, our integrated and smart ticketing program, and also our rail operations and our operational ex areas. So we are allowed to tailor this income and expenditure account to match how we prepare our management reporting. So those headings should hopefully be familiar to you from the financial outcome report that we just looked at. Okay, I'll come round the clock. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about in integrated and smart tickets and expenditure. Now you'll be able to see um, that income expenditure is elevated on the prior year. So if, you, if we just cast across from 1819 to 1920, we'll be able to see both higher expenditure and higher income. Now this is reflecting two interrelated points. And again, some of this is reflecting the IST phase three capital that we reclassified as revenue. So of that 12.181 million pounds worth of expenditure that I've highlighted, 4.32 of that is related to that reclassification. And the income is within the 9.85. So that was not shown in 1819 because that was capital expenditure and did not go through our income expenditure account. So that is a major issue for us this year. And the second point, as we talked about, is all phase three activity this year has been treated as revenue. So again, it recognises an incremental pickup on revenue expenditure, mostly driven by phase three. Now, the box below recognises that income above the line that I've pointed the arrow to is ring-fenced to the areas of activity. So we've touched on this when we talked about grants. So anything above that line, any income that we are recognising there is discrete to those programmes of activity, so those headline areas. So where we've got £11,000 worth of income against the strategic development corridors area, that reflects that we have a very small amount of grant that we are using for trans Pennine Tunnel modelling. And that is ring fenced to that area of activity, so we show it there. Likewise, we've got just shy of £27 million worth of income shown against NPR. And that reflects the TDF grant that we've applied in year. And as we know, that is only for use on the NPR programme. So we show that income above the line. Now, income below that line includes non-ring fence grants. So when we're looking at that 10,940 number, that includes £10 million worth of core grants. However, what it also recognises is capital grants that have been received in year and applied to capital expenditure. So I talked previously that there was £940,000 a capital grant received from the Department of Transport in year that we applied immediately to phase two IST program capital expenditure. So that goes below the line. I've just dropped down another box. Um, I've got an arrow pointing to £1,009,000 worth of expenditure. That is pension revaluation expenditure. So when we perform the, um, the pensions, um, um, calculations that we've, we've discussed previously, we revalue the assets and where there's a valuation number, we recognise it there. And if you can see, um, compared to 1819, we recognise that just shy of a million pounds worth of valuation um, expenditure last year and it's gone up again. So we've got within two years just shy of two million pounds worth of expenditure related to our pension fund. It's going to come round the clock. Um, the next box is pointing to our finance and investment income and expenditure. Now, members will be familiar with the fact that TFN cannot access any credit. So we have no legal powers to access borrowing, whether that be an overdraft or a loan from the capital markets to fund expenditure. So what this is principally recognising is two things. Now, the first is pension financing costs and income. So again, when we perform the pension calculations that we're required to undertake under statute, 
there is some pension interest costs and some pensions income. Now, the £234,000 that is recognised in 1920 as expenditure is pensions expenditure cost. There is also income from pensions within the £234,000 worth of income as shown in 2019-20. So the fact that those two numbers net to zero is entirely coincidental. Um, and within that 234 is the income that we generated by holding cash on deposit over the course of the year. So there's £106,000 worth of income within that 234 that is solely related to the cash that we hold in bank accounts and money market funds and so on and so forth until we need it to apply to expenditure. I'll come around the clock again um, and we'll look at the income that was shown in 2018-19-20 below the line, so the taxation and non-specific grant income. Now, compared to uh, the, the same comparison in 1920, there was a fairly significant movement there. And we talked about this in previous slides, and it reflects that in 2018-19-20, we received an awful lot of grants that had previously been held on our behalf by Greater Manchester Combined Authority. So we talked about £16 million worth of core grants. About £16 million is within that 23.47. And that's £6 million, the difference between the 16 and 10, the 6 went through to our reserves to form the basis of our reserve, our core grant reserve. Now, again, within that number, there was an awful lot of capital grant received in year where the conditions have been met. And because the conditions have been met, we have to take it through the IME and through to our capital grants on applied account. So in 1819, we had a largely one-off situation where lots of stuff came in and we had to flush it through for the first time. That was quietened down into 1920, where we're into business as usual, and we have a much smaller number. I'll come around the clock again, um, and I have an arrow pointing to the zero which is the income for the operational areas. Now, that is zero in 2018-19, and it is zero in 2019-20, but we're obviously showing fairly significant amounts of expenditure against that line. Now, this just reflects that all our operational areas are funded from the non-ring fence core grant. So the £10 million of core grant pays for our operational areas. Now, the reason why we don't show that 10 million above the line is that it is below the line in non-specific granting. So it looks like the operational areas are completely unfunded. They aren't. It's just that we have to show the income below the line. Now, the final point um, is to recognize that we, in 2019-20, um, we changed our management accounting reporting to split out rail operations from our operational areas. So we talked about this as a committee when we set the budget last year, um, and we reflected that it was important for both transparency reasons um, and to enable people to understand the amounts of money that we were putting into what was a key number priority that we showed them discreetly from our operational areas. So last year, that rail operations line wasn't there, and we've inserted it this year. So that reflects the change in our management accounts and reporting structure. Okay, so that is a whistle-stop tour around the comprehensive income and expenditure statement. Um, I'm happy to take any questions at that point. Any questions? No, no, I haven't got uh, any, Gareth. I'm just conscious that we're actually getting a little bit short on time, so uh, I may have to uh, just pace yeah. it through, through the remaining. Uh, okay, shares. I'll step it up. Um, next, um, Co-financial statement is our balance sheet, uh, so it details assets and liabilities, um, reserves um, show how the net assets are funded, and reserves are split between those that are usable that we can apply to revenue, uh, to resource expenditure, so whether that be the general fund reserves or the capital grants on applied reserve. Unusable reserves are not available to resource expenditure. That includes our capital adjustment account, our pensions reserves account, and our accumulated absence reserves. And those unusable reserves allow for statutory overrides. So we talked about the fact that we have accounting rules, but then sometimes we have to apply statutory overrides. Where we do that, we, we move the money through the unusable reserves. So this is the balance sheet for the year. 
I'll just quickly rattle through these. The first line shows the intangible assets. We've moved from £5.8 million pounds to £3.5 million. Pounds. This is a net movement. It reflects two things. We spent some money on intangibles that we talked about before, um, whether that be our ERP system or the phase two intangible assets, complex information systems. We've also written out the phase three capitalized expenditure. So we took some money out, but we've invested some in year. So that's why it's down on year. Committee members on note that the short term debtors have increased. It's gone from 178 to 599. Those debtors comprise largely of Rail North grant income that is due to us. Now, we are particularly sensitive to when um, some of the major combined authorities pay their money over. Um, and as at the year end, one of those major combined authorities had not paid their dues by the year end. We've had that money in April, so it's all good. It's not particularly a problem, but that just recognises the increase. Our members will know that cash and cash equivalents, that's cash that we've either got within the bank or on short-term deposits, has increased by £5 million roughly. There is a correlation here to the increase in our short-term creditors. So we've got more cash in the bank, but we owe more people money. And that just reflects that at the year end, we were waiting on invoices to come in from lots of our suppliers, principally Network Rail. So Network Rail are our biggest supplier. They have not billed us at the year end. So we've got quite a bit of money um, owed to them, which means that we've got more cash in bank. Um, members will note that the provisions value has increased from 126 grand to seven, from 77 grand. It's relatively a material increase, but it just reflects that TFM is taking on um, some remediation obligations associated with its leased accommodation in Manchester. Moving down to reserves, um, members will note that Usable reserves have increased, and there's a couple of reasons for this. We have underspend on core grant funded activity that has gone through to our core grant reserve. We've recognised the new devolved powers reserve, which is £500,000. And our capital grants on applied account has also increased. We talked about that previously. That is the phase three funding that has been re-recognised. Unusable reserves have moved into debit. So they were credit to 057 last year, then now debit 2714. What, what's there? Again, we moved the funding associated with phase three out of the capital adjustment account back into the usable reserves. So we've taken 4 million um, out. And we've also reflected the increase in the pensions liability through our pensions reserve. So our unusable reserves have, have changed fairly significantly over the course of the year. Members will be able to see that the pension liability has increased um, from 3.6 million to 6.1 million. This again touches on um, the issues that we talked about previously. We valued our pension, uh, net estimated pension liability as at the 31st of March. The markets were in flux. The uh, discount rating decreased, which means that the liability increases. And our grants received in advance has moved down from £900,000 uh, £1, to just £10,000 relating to the issues that we just talked about, um, that we had TDF grant that we recognised last year that was spent in year. So the balance sheet tells a nice story. It reflects everything that we previously talked about, and hopefully it's beginning to make more sense. Okay. The next statement is the cash flow statement. This details the inflows and outflows of cash in TFM's bank accounts over the course of the year. Um, now, the statement re removes non-cash transactions that were acquired under accounting, accounting standards, such as depreciation and amortization. So there's lots of transactions that go through our accounts that do, do not create cash movements. So the statement is split between uh, flows of cash relating to operating activities, that's our day-to-day -day activity, normally of revenue nature, um, our investing activity, which is ordinarily our capital activity, and our financing activity. Um, now, this shows how TFN has financed activity through credit, but as we know, TFN can't access credit, so there's nothing to show there. So this is our um, cash flow statement. Now, it's put together, um, and the starting point is the uh, deficit that is shown on the CIES. So if we were to go back to that slide previously, we'd note that there was a deficit, an accounting deficit of £1.5 million. So that is the basis for our cash flow statement. 
The then add back um, are the items that do not represent cash movements, but where we're taking accruals, where we're taking provisions, where we're showing net pensions movements and amortization charges. They don't um, result in a cash flow, so we strip them out at that point. We then adjust for financing activities. So TFN um, has no finance activity, and this simply relates to investment items in CIES. Talked before, talked about a 10.94 million number. That 0.94 was um, phase two capital grant, so we recognise that. So that gives us um, net cash flow from operating activities for the year of 2.3 million. We then show net cash flows from investment activities. So that's all our capital expenditure, um, our capital grants and so on. That was 2.6 million. The sum of those two together is 4.936 million. And just as a check, we started the, the year with 4.37 million pounds at bank. We've ended the year with 19.3 million pounds. So the difference there is the 4.9. So. That's some good confidence there that our cash flow balances because we can tie that back to our bank account. Okay. Now, the important point, the last slide I've got for you today is a reconciliation of our management outturn to our com uh, comprehensive income and expenditure statement. So this is where we take our budget position, the, the, the financial outturn position that I've just talked about, and compare it to our income and expenditure account. So the important place to start was that through the outturn report, we know that we've spent £46.82 million pounds worth of expenditure in the year, and we know that that position was fully funded from income. So we can't access borrowing, so all our expenditure is fully funded from grants. So we then have to make some adjustments. So if we just start with income, some of the income in the CIES relates to pensions. We talked about there was some pensions investment income. That's £130,000. Now, that's in the CIES because we're obliged to put it in per accounting standards, but that has nothing to do with our actual outturn position on a budget basis. So we don't include it in our financial outturn. We've also got an adjustment related to the phase three write-down. So as you recall, there is £4.32 million worth of income in the CIES. We've not shown that through our term because we recognised all that in 1819, and this is just a technical adjustment to our accounts. Now, there are items that are in our outturn position that are not in the income expenditure account. So where we've taken money from reserves to pay for activity, we show that in our outturn, because that is how we funded our activity over the course of the year. But that income isn't shown in the i &E because it's already been recognised in prior years. So it's just adjusted at the end of the year through reserves. So £1.67 million worth of revenue funding from reserves paid for the IST programme and £2.44 million worth of IST capital was taken from reserves to pay for in-year IST capital expenditure. So it's in our outturn account, but we don't show it in the i &E because we've already shown it in the i &E in 1819. And we also need to show um, amounts that are in the income and expenditure accounts that aren't in our term relating to contributions to our reserves. So we talked about surpluses on revenue grants and the fact that we need to flush them through the income and expenditure account and then hold them in the reserves. We also talked about surpluses of core grants, and those surpluses need to again be shown as income received in the CIES and taken to reserves. Now, we don't record a surplus in our outturn position. We only show the income that we need to match off against expenditure. So over the course of the year, um, there was 888 grand's worth of core grant underspend that has gone through to our core grant reserve. We have £500,000 of core grant savings that were taken to our default powers reserve. And we had 666 grand's worth of IST revenue grant surplus that we're holding in the near amount reserve. So we started at 46.82, and we flush those through, and we get to the 49.21 million pounds worth of income that is recognised in our income and expenditure account. And again, we can do a similar exercise on expenditure. So our expenditure outturn position was 46.82 million pounds. There are items in the income and expenditure account that we don't record in our outturn. That includes depreciation. 
So that's not a real charge, but we do have to account for it. And that was £250,000. We've got all the pension adjustments that we need to make per accounting standards, but that we don't recognise an outturn. In the outturn, we only show the, the payments, the employer contributions to our pension fund. Again, we've got our write down of the phase three activity. We've got our movement on the absence provision. Again, that's not an outturn issue. It's only required by accounting standards. But then we have items that are in our outturn position and that are not in the CIES. And that includes our capital program. So capital expenditure does not go through your income and expenditure statement, but we do report it as part of our outturn capital program position. So 2.28 on phase two and 111 grand on our ERP. So we add those together and we get to 51.72 million pounds for the year, which if I just flick back, we'll be able to say 57.12 plus the 1.009 gets you to the 51.7 million pounds for the year. So that is the reconciliation, um, and I'm happy to take any questions at that point. I don't think we've uh, got any questions at the moment, uh, Gareth. Thank you um, for that very comprehensive run through. Uh, does that bring you to the end of your um, section? It does indeed. Um, well, it's very so sad, Gareth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, because, uh, as you mentioned earlier, you are leaving us, and um, I, I did really want to thank you on behalf of the committee very much for all your contributions that you've made, and, uh, and to wish you um, the very best for the future. Thank so, you very much. Take care. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you for your patience and clarity of explanation, Gareth. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, conscious, this is all easier to do in person than um, over a presentation, but hopefully made some sense this time around. Yeah, it's been very good. Thank you, Gareth. No problem. Okay, that uh, takes us to um, the next item, which is item seven, and this is the uh, annual governance statement. Deborah, are you taking us through that? Yes, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? I'm, yes, I'm yes. Muted yeah. myself. Yes, um, the reason that the annual governance statement is taken as a separate report, even though it has to be um, presented and published at the same time as the uh, statement of accounts, is because the law requires the board to approve it separately from the accounts, which is why it's a separate item on your agenda. Now, the uh, annual governance statement has been brought to you previously in draft form. And this is the statement of the review that's been take, undertaken during the year of the internal systems of control within TFN, which together safeguard the expenditure of public money. TFN is required to carry out this review annually and to prepare the report to be published in accordance and at the same time as the annual statement of accounts. The review examines TFN's processes against SIP for guidelines and principles of good governance. And the findings of the review have been set out in the annual governance statement in the table, um, which sets out the findings against each of the principles individually. The draft has previously been brought to members, the committee, and members have individually had an opportunity to make comments on the report, and those comments have been taken into account into this final draft version. The review picks up the improvements to the internal systems of control carried out during the year. Examples of this are the uh, review of procurement processes and moving to a formal workflow system, which takes out the bureaucratic paper systems. We carried out a governance review of the gifts and hospitality pos policy and also whistleblowing policies to improve these policies. More recently, we've had to respond to the COVID pandemic and introduce new procedures for virtual meetings. 
we've managed to maintain transparency and to hold open meetings, which many uh, councils have not uh, progressed to. We've introduced a new protocol for virtual meetings, which are live streamed to the public. Another improvement to our governance has been the extension of the membership of the Partnership Board to invite representatives of the TUC, the, climate, the Committee for Climate Change, Disability UK and Transport Focus to join the Partnership Board, so representing wider interests of the community. We've also developed under the Sustainable and Inclusive Growth heading a pathway to 2050 and are working on a decarbonisation strategy to be adopted later in this financial year. Internally, TFN has developed its wellbeing agenda and particularly been very supportive of employees through this uh, remote working period. And finally, under transparency, TFN has introduced the new monthly operating reports, which bring together financial and operational information in one place and make this public. Finally, the, the uh, review accesses the challenges facing TFN in 1920-21 going forward. That will include developing the scrutiny function and uh, we're in discussions with um, trainers for a, a, a programme of training throughout, throughout the year, looking at how we can develop the role of scrutiny first. And obviously we will be reviewing um, remote working and ensuring the uh, security of our systems going forward. So I don't know if members have any questions on the annual government statement. I, I can't see anybody, but obviously we've, uh, we've looked at this before. Um, in terms of today, Deborah, are you looking for a, an approval by this committee to take it to the... Um, the, the recommendation is that the committee approve it, recommend it to the board to mm -hmm. be approved at the same time as the annual accounts in July. Right. Okay, has anybody got any um, objections to this committee uh, recommending? Um, Chris, Chris, it's Keith. No, I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any dispute or any difficulty with that. I just would like to say to uh, Deborah, thank you very much indeed for the report. A lot of work in there, but also I welcome the. Um, the uh, importance uh, that's been shown towards scrutiny. Uh, I think it's, it's we've had a lack of scrutiny. I've mentioned it before in a previous meeting. Uh, and it's something we need to get on top of because that's important, uh, both for the board and for this committee as well. So I welcome the, uh, the input that's going to be put into uh, getting scrutiny working much more efficiently. Thank you. OK, thank you, uh, Keith. A any other points? I in that case, in that case, Deborah, I think uh, we, we, you can take it that uh, this committee is recommending uh, for it to go forward to the board. OK. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, OK, that takes us on to item eight now, external audit. And have we got Karen? I am here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll be very, very brief with this report because it is relatively short anyway. And we did talk uh, a few minutes ago um, about the changes to the timetable. So really, this report just confirms that we are on track to deliver your audit, having received the accounts. We are working with you towards having the audit work completed by the uh, July Audit Committee so that you can take them onto the board by the end of the month. That will be the normal statutory timetable. There is... Um, as I mentioned earlier, some risk attached to that around the assurances and so on that we need from other places may put that at risk, but we will report that back to you. 
But if it does happen and there is some slippage, um, the statutory deadline was was shifted back anyway until the 30th of November. So um, there isn't anything to be overly concerned about in terms of consequence for uh, the audit not being completed as we planned. I think probably just worth saying, actually, that um, it's really impressive that we got the accounts in uh, on time, that they were still ready by the end of March, because uh, by the end of May, because a lot of organisations have struggled to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, th th so all credit to, to Gareth and his team for the work that they've done. Um, in terms of the rest of this paper, Section 2 just sets out some reports that you might be interested in because you're responsible for the, for the uh, governance around the organisation. But the only one I really need to bring to your attention is the National Audit Office paper, which is the second one on the list, which is about the new code of audit practice that will apply from the financial year 2020-21. So that's the year we're in as opposed to the year we're auditing. And that just makes some changes around the value for money conclusion, which I will explain more fully in due course because they're not a problem at the moment. We'll think about them uh, down the line. So I will bring the presentation back to you in due course once the uh, supplementary guidance from the National Audit Office has been published. But other than that, that's all I need to say. Do you explain that, Karen? Um, well, they were working to an early autumn publication date. So they, they published some draft consultation this week. That's about to, or intended to publish it this week. That's about two weeks behind the original timetable. So um, I expect probably September time. OK, thanks. Any questions for Cara? No. Um, Keith? No. No, no, we're OK. Thank you for that, Karen. Yeah. Um, Thank you, then. It, it um, is dangerous, Chair, to be questioning Karen, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to question me any time. <laughs> uh, very good. OK, um, let's move on to internal audit then, uh, Section 9. Um, thanks, thanks, Chairman. What I'm going to do, Andrew Moore's going to introduce the system manager works with Alex Hire and I. Mm -hmm. um, Andy will run through the assignment reports, progress paper, take it as read but pull out salient, and then I'll pick up the annual summary. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thank you very much. As uh, Lisa mentioned, first time at this committee, so I appreciate the opportunity to present and hopefully down the line I'll be able to meet a lot of you in person when we're back up and running as normal. But as Lisa says, um, if we take the report as read, I'll just pull out some of the key points from the report. So if we start with the progress paper, so if I just draw your attention to the report, uh, section two on page four, which just highlights the two internal audit reports that have been issued as final since the previous committee. So the first one relates to the follow-up report, which is the final report from 1920, so that signifies the completion of the 1920 plan, and the risk management report, which is the first report from the 2021 plan. In terms of appendix A in the next page, is just that sets out some of the dates for the rest of the year. So we've had good engagement with the exec team, although we're carrying out audit remote, we've still got that engagement and we're in the process of scooping some of the documents, some of the audits for the rest of the year. And then the final point from this paper in Appendix B on page 8 was just to draw attention to one change to the plan, which relates to the flexi time plan, which is moved from May to September. So it's just a timing issue with this one. Although we are progressing with remote working, this is one of those that's best suited to on-site, if possible. We do have a contingency in place to carry this out remotely if the lockdown carries on. But it's one that we've moved to September with the idea of carrying this out on-site, if possible. So that was it for the progress paper. Happy to take any questions before moving on to the two um, final reports. Any questions? No, no. Uh, yeah. okay. Can I go, Kevin? Yeah. Quick, just yeah. a quickie, really. In, in terms of uh, this, this reference to um, uh, increasing the the uh, adjustment around. Um, Cyber and, and the, the with with COVID and the likelihood of increased phishing, etc. So I, I wondered, in terms of the audit plan, whether we should be thinking about bringing the um, internal audit forward. Um, I, I'm just wondering whether pushing it to the the December date uh, might 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 we be able to 
pull that forward in, in terms of current risk around um, cyber and fraud? Um, I, I, it's just a thought, really. I just wondered whether there might be some flexibility to um, re- rearrange some of that that plan, and wh- whether or not we're, we're you know, I'm ju- just concerned about the risk that we might be at. Um, but we won't pick it up until later in the, the calendar year. Yes, yeah, so that one's currently in for September. I suppose from our side, I mean, we we should be able to accommodate moving that earlier. If we'll look at the resources. It's I suppose as the committee, it's whether it's agreed that that's best suited pulling forward rather than the initial time. Um, Chair, if I may, I think Kevin Willens is on the call, who is our head of IT. Um, I think it, it, it's probably worth us, us in this away and, and just having a think about how we, we might accommodate this. I know the IT team the, you know, operational quite a lot going on in, in, and then, than they have in normal times because of remote working and the emphasis that puts on um, the, our, our IT systems. Would it be worth Would it be worth us? Um, having a discussion about this and bringing it bringing it back. Um, Let's bring it back to the next uh, meeting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So can have an. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Chris. Be noted. Okay. Okay. So we, the next report. Report. So this, as I mentioned, this is the final one from 1920. So this report looked at the implementation of management actions from all of the reports. And our assessment is that good progress has been made to implement those actions. So there was just two out of the 20 assessed as ongoing. And on page five in the table, it just highlights the two that we've said ongoing and we've agreed revised implementation risk management and one in relation to cybersecurity controls. Today, again, will be followed up as part of our follow-up order that we'll carry out this year. So there's just any questions on that report specifically? No, I think self-explanatory, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And then the one report from this year that's been completed is the risk management, which is one I have some of the risks on the risk grid. This one is just the, the journey completed the last two, three years now. Fusion. So that we're just as risk management processes, age with low management action according to so the dates of review when the risk registers are reviewed. So Again, this is one we've carried out remotely with good engagement from Hadi, and it's just a one low management action. So happy to take any questions on this report. What's the uh, follow-up on the actions then? Do you have a, a sort of timetable or process? For following up on the actions raised yeah. in this report? Mm-hmm. Yes, so it'll be able this this will more likely be followed up as part of our follow-up review net. Follow up review we do in 1920 after when we do our follow up. We'll this is when we'll. That seems like a long time. <laughs> uh, it, it is. It's supposed to whether we, we come up with any different approach. That's the, I've been the approach we've done in the last year, so. That's usually our methodology across the board, really. Yeah, and one of the options is that we can do an update, say, for the December meeting or six months, because I think it's one of those things, you think about it, we're now in June. Next committee might be a little bit soon, but maybe that one November, December committee, we can put something in. That's not a problem. If you prefer prefer, it it works with us as long as management's happy, we're happy. Yeah, no, I just think uh, um, it seems like a long period, um, to wait without sort of any updates on it. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to do that. Yeah, we can do that. That's not common. We can liaise with the income. I've got, I've got absolutely no, no problem with that at all. 
Thank you. Okay. Anything else? That was it from me. Um, suppose any other questions from the committee before I hand over to Lisa to go through the annual report? No questions, so I'll have to you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Really quick report. You would have taken it, and it should be made this document. Build our program, a couple of meetings. You know, it is possible and reasonable, good progress. It really there is a aid memoir, but a completion um, for you in terms of the year end, just finished. Okay. Anybody, any questions for our internal auditors? No, I think uh, I think we're good. So thank, thank you, you. For, uh, for your updates. Thank you. And uh, that now takes us to item 10. And as I said at the start of the meeting, um, Ian's going to take us through the uh, the risk, uh, corporate risk register report. Um, just to say at the start, however, because this is really Hadi's area, uh, if there are any then we may get those to the next meeting. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I'll just put um, the um, on the screen uh, just, to, just as we go. So, as, as then at least newly a, 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 a corporate risk to um, to the board is to um, present the report in um, July, July board on the 29th. Um, there are actually this is the, the first opportunity that the audit and governance committee will have to to consider the risk register. There, there will be a further opportunity um, at the next audit committee meeting um, pre that pre that board. Um, but really, this was just a, a, an opportunity to take. Um, the committee um, through the headline risk that we have. I, I won't go through all, everything in detail, but I will draw out where we have, um, I think, specific points uh, to note. Or there are areas that are significantly changed from previous um, uh, times we've, we've we've been through this as a committee. Obviously, risk is a standing item; it's on the agenda um, uh, at every meeting. So hopefully, most of this I think will be um, familiar to members. Um, so I'll, I'll just quickly run through what I think the, the key points are, and um, I would be very happy to take questions or comments. And as I say, there will be a, we'll take this away. Um, there will be a, an updated version based both on your comments and also on the on the passage of time um, that will then be brought back at the, at the next meeting. So I will um, I will just quickly uh, run through the headlines. Um, the first thing that I think people will will, re will notice is is that there is a is now a separate COVID-19 pandemic risk on the corporate risk register. That's obviously um, uh, uh, something that wasn't there previously. Um, we've been through COVID-19 risk in, in some detail um, previously in this meeting, so, so I won't dwell on that. But that is clearly an issue um, that, has, that has occurred. It's something that we're dealing with. Um, we've got mitigations in place that we've talked about, but there, there is is clearly still potential for further impacts of, of COVID-19 and it's something we need to be um, be aware of and it's, it's also something that is is picked up um, individually in some of the program risk, risk registers as well um, and it's impacting on, on those programs. I think um, most notably on the strategic rail risk um, which we'll come on to in a moment. Um, the next thing I'd I'd like to um, bring out I think is is the um, Transport decarbonisation and climate change emergency risk. Um, this is a risk that was um, was added to the corporate risk register following um, discussion at the TFM board. I think it's important to to understand here exactly what that that risk is is, is addressing. Um, I, I don't think we are um, saying that 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 climate change and, and and the impact of carbon is a medium risk possibility. Um, the, the risk refers very much to, to TFN's activity in the business plan in terms of, of, of its part in the national and um, northern response to, to climate change. So it's to be considered through the lens of the work that TFN has, 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 has agreed to undertake rather than, than through the lens of, of the risk um, as a whole. Um, Next, um, we've added a risk around um, T 
TFM compliance with relative, uh, sorry, with um, relevant laws and regulations. Um, unfortunately, that spans two pages, so I can't get both of those on the on the slide at the same time. Um, that was previously something that we that we'd included, and, and I think good practice is to, is to include it. So we've we've put it back on the on the risk register, but that isn't something that is um, is 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 showing as a as a high risk um, at, at the moment. And then I think um, finally, um, I think this this this. this, this the bottom two are probably probably worth um, bringing people's attention to. Um, the first is the Northern Powers um, strategic outline case risk. Obviously, um, this this is assessing the risk against the new timetable, which was a, agreed, which has been agreed um, by the board, which is um, moved the delivery of the SFC back three months. Um, that was um, noted in Annex A of the monthly. The operating report that we talked about earlier, um, that is due to the, 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 the largely due to the impact of, of COVID-19. Um, and then finally, the rail operations risk, which I will, will dwell on slightly longer, um, Chair, if I may. Um, I'll just go down to that risk now. Um, we have actually had a, had a, who's obviously not here uh, uh, today, as has undertaken quite an extensive process with the, um, the strategic rail team. Um, you'll see the nature of these risks has, has, has changed. I think of all our operations, um, almost self-evidently the one that has been most um, fundamentally affected um, by the COVID-19 pandemic has been rail operations, as we've, we've already discussed. Um, and, and the nature of the risk description you will see has changed significantly from from the last time you've looked at this in the, in the February meeting in that this is now less about um, issues around delivering TIU and delivering franchise commitments um, and is 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 more um, uh, more more keenly focused on the risks that are being generated by COVID-19. Um, one that the there will be delays to 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 the enhancement of of, of passenger benefit of, of, of the services and, and and infrastructure that that were, were, were previously promised, um, but also the risk that we were talking about previously that around future schemes being less viable, both operational schemes and infrastructure schemes, because of lower demand forecasts. And and we've already um, committed uh, earlier in this meeting to to bring a. Um, a report back from the strategic rail team or a, a presentation back from the strategic rail team to address that. Um, so that was really that was really all I wanted to say. I think this was really an opportunity for, for, for people to to consider and comment and really um, if there's anything we, we need to be to, to be amending in, in the view of the committee um, before we take this forward to the board. Um, this is an opportunity to do that. Okay. Anybody got any comments, uh, concerns? Kevin, if I could bring you in. Uh, yes. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, we can hear you. I, it was just a, 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 <laughs> it was just an assurance, uh, Ian, really, around the um, the COVID um, drop at risk theme uh, in terms of the mitigation and ownership. Um, I'm assuming that underneath the sort of um, operating board members that there's more detail in terms of specific ownership around specific risks. Um, and I suppose that the, the only assurance really looking on that because it's the classic, you know, if it's body. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming that sitting behind is a much more detailed sort of your programme risk, etc., and with, with delineated ownership. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good point, point, Kevin. Um, I think the first thing uh, that probably needs to be changed is, is the the risk strategy owner in terms of COVID nineteen is probably the chief executive. Um, uh, if, if we're looking for the, 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 the single point of responsibility, um, and I think I would would just reassure you that the, the risks. The risks are being reflected in the um, the the, the, the organisations um, risk registers, be they pro, be they programmes or, or or departmental risk registers, and there are 
um, individuals tagged for the for the um, for responsible for responsibility for managing those risks. I think the 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 issue as you, as you appreciate with COVID nineteen is 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 the all encompassing nature of the of the risk. It, it, where it impacts it impact impacts across across a wide range of activity. Um, so yes, that is that is recognised in our in our risk registers. But that's certainly something that we can we can just look at how we present that when we bring this back. Thanks for that, Ian. That's really helpful. Okay. Any any other questions? No, I don't think so. Um, okay, Ian. Thank you. Fine. So. Um, Anything else at all on, on risk, um, which we need to take for obviously capturing the COVID uh, position in, in the risk register now. So, um, unless there's anything else, um, can we, um, can we move on to, um, the next, um, committee date? Now, the next, um, committee date is 16th of July. And that will be uh, once again taking place um, via remote uh, systems. Um, so everybody could just make a note in the diary for that. And also, um, if people could make a note of the future dates, which are on the agenda, um, 24th of September, 19th of November and 18th of Feb. Um, I guess it'll... Time will tell whether we actually have um, physical meetings by then, but um, at the moment, if we could just make notes in the diaries. Um, if, the, and then, if the committee sorry. are agree in agreement with that, Chair, I'd, uh, I'll send out sort of save the date placeholders to uh, to everyone. That would be really, really helpful. Thank you. Could I just bring in Ian there? Um, yeah, Chris, it was just, just to make the point, referring back to Karen's um, 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 presentation earlier, uh, he the final sign off of the accounts. If, if there are delays to the pension fund audit, to be provisional because we, we may, depending on the timing of the audit approval, we need to to think about re rearranging or retiming one of the boards. Um, and obviously, we'd need to potentially need to stack the, the audit committee. Um, that preceded that in a way that um, allowed you to give final sign-off to the accounts. So there may just be a little bit of flexibility required, depending on the um, how the how the audit goes. Okay, uh, but for the moment we'll we'll, we'll stick with the uh, the dates we've got. Once yeah. We're here otherwise. Uh, can I bring in Chris? Chris, hello. At the moment. Can you, Chris? There you go. That, that, that looks like yeah. it. Sorry. I'm, I'm really sorry, Chris. We can't hear you. Uh, it's just so late. Going with that problem. We've had serious problems, are and I was very late during the meeting. But I do, but in fact, Ian just said, but I would go back and make one hugely similar because people can't. Oh, well, then Ian put it that way, okay? Sorry about that. Okay, S sorry. Um, we probably just caught a bit of that, Chris. Uh, <laughs> but um, do, are we okay with that? Did anybody pick up that, what Chris was saying? Uh, I got the gist of it. I'll, um, okay. I've, I'll, I'll email him outside of this. Yeah, Chris. okay. That, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, okay. Uh, any other business? From uh, Chris, it's just Keith. No, I've no other business, but I just wanted to add my thanks to yours, to Gareth, uh, for his, uh, his work on behalf of uh, not only TFN, but on behalf of the audit committee. Uh, been superb and wish him every success and uh, into his new job. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Keith. Ian, did you want yeah, to say? Yeah, um, it was just you, you, you both beat me to it. Um, but it was, it was. Um, I was just going to mention that all the hard work that Gareth put in um, over over a number of years, actually, but certainly since we've become a statutory body and we've been um, obviously engaging with the audit committee. So, 
Um, I'd just like to to put that on record. Good. Thank you. Um, all the best then to everybody. Everybody keep safe and um, end of meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you.